Hello, everyone. Um, I was really honored to get the invitation and come here and speak to you guys. And I had a pleasure to meet Richard a couple of times before. I don't know if you remember me, um, but uh, I spent my last 10 years in the Valley, well, actually in the U.S. I moved to the uh, U.S. in 2004 when I graduated from my bachelor's at Tsinghua University. And um, at the time I was a science nerd, I um, decided to pursue an academic career. I came here, got into a PhD program at Case Western, right um, in um, Cleveland, Ohio. I spent four years there and figured that I don't like really like academic work in the end. Um, I wanted to get out, but um, at the time, I think uh, most of the job opportunities out there are more research-centric positions in industry or in academia. So I decided to try, give consulting a try. I was um, miserably rejected by McKinsey, but um, got an offer from a, a local consulting firm based in Foster City in the Bay Area, where we work with top 20 global pharmaceutical companies t for their um, uh, streamlined clinical trial and clinical strategies. So in 2008, that's when I graduated from my PhD program and decided to move to the Bay Area. And that has changed my life because the Bay Area is just very different from Midwest. Um, so after a few years at a consulting firm, I was working really hard and learned a lot. But in the end, I just feel like it's much more exciting to sit on the other end of the table where I get to implement strategies because consultants assume that the world is the perfect, so they always vouch for the best strategy to do everything. But in businesses, it's not really about the best strategy, it's about having imp um, incremental growth and improvement. So that's just a little bit rundown myself. And then I ended up in, in the spring, I was um, lucky enough to know the investors and people who are setting it up in 2012 a little bit. And they trusted me to run in the spring and, and I joined in 2012 and eventually became uh, a leader. I call myself a chief fire starter uh, just because it's fun. So <laughs> we had a team of eight. We're based in Santa Clara and uh, I want to spend some time, really a little bit time talking about ourselves. But really today uh, I was invited to share my um, observation about U.S.-China cross-border startup acceleration and technology entrepreneurship. I, would, um, I was initially thinking about about how to um, structure my talk, but eventually I had some materials about uh, my um, understanding about China and why people are interested, why um, there are, um, despite of the big blasts out there, companies continue to fail in the space. And recently there are some companies that are doing well, and why are they doing well? And um, for the entrepreneurs that are out there interested in going global, when and when should you do it, and why, why should you or should, shouldn't you do it? Um, those type of questions I wanted to have some discussion around. Um, I do hope this is an interactive session, so I see a lot of um, people with different backgrounds. So can I just have a show of hands? How many of you really knows about US and China feel that you can contribute a lot to the topic I'm talking about today? Okay, we got a couple. So we got some experts in the audience, obviously. And we also so. have some very modest people. Oh. <laughs> Good. So um, just interrupt me anytime, um, and um, hopefully this will be helpful for you guys. So let's get started. I don't have a pointer, so I have to move the laptop. Sorry Do about that. Oh, okay, that's okay. Um, all right. Uh, so in the spring, Inno Spring was founded to be the first US China technology incubator. Um, I, the investors of Inno Spring really are the shareholders of it. It's primarily led by Tusk Park, which is the largest uh, innovation and technology transfer management company for Tsinghua University. And then they expanded to more than 15 provinces and cities all over China now in the past decade, 15 years. Um, and the other major shareholder of Inno Spring is Northern Light VC, founded by one of the most successful entrepreneurs who uh, brought his own company public in the U.S. and in 2005 decided to go back to China and started his own venture firm. He also had a decade of experience investing in U.S. and China. And uh, the reason why they, these two 
you know, teamed up to found InnoSpring was really out of the frustration where there just isn't a professional run platform that educate entrepreneurs, not just immigrant entrepreneurs, about the cross-border development, about connecting US and China. Uh, it's about really bridging US-China, the barriers, um, the, the misunderstanding of culture, the misunderstanding of knowledge across two different markets, and how do we open up opportunities to all entrepreneurs, regardless of their race, their, their, um, their background, about their successful business and the cross-border space. Eventually, the world is the same space. Um, given that China is the, currently the biggest internet market in the world, companies are going to go to China eventually. But still, with 10 years of continuous effort, um, most companies still fail in the space. So um, we were founded to be the first time we step one step forward, where we establish a foundation in Silicon Valley for the first time, providing a platform of support for entrepreneurs who really want to eventually go to China, for Chinese companies who really want to come out to Silicon Valley and partner with the best entrepreneurs and best people in Silicon Valley. So um, as I said, our business model initially in 2005 was centered around uh, managing a co-working space, 15,000 square feet co-working space based in Santa Clara. And at the same time, we have our own fund, InnoSpring Seed Fund, where we go out and actively invest in startups. But at the same time, um, the relationship really comes out the best where the entrepreneurs have some interest of eventually expanding to Asia or China market, where we continue break, um, breed and nurture that relationship to educate them and to help them of where they should set up their strategy to eventually help them to bridge to a different marketplace. Um, of course, we also are blessed with 80 different local mentors who help us set up a mentorship program to help entrepreneurs to grow here in Silicon Valley. Um, what really set us apart from a lot of other perhaps similar organizations with similar uh, missions, uh, we initially set up to be a platform to plug in resources in the complicated space of cross-border development, right? So we be eventually became a, a place where companies can really establish early relationships of Chinese VCs or VCs who have cross-border expertise. Um, given that most VCs are moving to the earlier stage relationship building with tech companies, a lot of Chinese VCs or cross-border VCs are also doing the same thing. But they don't have dedicated staff and effort to nurture the early stage conversation relationships because they just have a huge fund and they have dedicated on um, the growth stage investing that they're doing. So for us, we initially set up us to be um, a place where we plug in resources from VCs, uh, i.e. that being um, that shapes our business model where we raise 100% of our capital from venture capitals. Um, so we're not just any angel fund that you see um, that typically exists in Silicon Valley. We're an angel fund, a seed fund backed by institutional VC partners. So our fund one, uh, we're lucky to partner up with Kleiner Perkins, both US and China, um, GSR Ventures, Northern Light VCs, Antique Angel Fund, and CBC Venture Fund um, to help really invest in technology companies to open up their existing resources, their penetration, their brand to entrepreneurs at very early stage and help them to go through continuous seed and angel and series A funding and bring them into growth stage opportunities. That helped them cut down their cost of uh, really developing expertise in understanding entrepreneurship itself, in developing meaningful relationship by uh, scaling the relationship out of working with different type of VCs in various different spaces, also cutting down the cost of raising next round of capital, um, not just um, restricted from raising from our um, the VCs that invest in our fund. Uh, we do develop relationship to be uh, um, open, so we work with other funds that don't invest in us yet. So that model tend to work really well. With two years of operation, we've successfully invested in 19 companies. I'll talk about those companies later, but. But um, right now, we just closed our fund too, and we brought in Legend Capitals, IDG, Excel, partners in SoftBank, and, and other notable VCs who become part of the network that we support entrepreneurs with. 
Um, so Inner Spring is not just local now. So through the um, over the past two years, we've been really active in developing relationships all over the world with government, mostly government-run incubators or private incubators. Through partnership, we also bridge entrepreneurs from all over the world to Silicon Valley to have them train, to have them set up, to have develop, to have them develop the global entrepreneurship dream. We recently also opened up two of our own offices in China. China, just to make sure that a lot of our companies are growing towards a mature stage because we've been actively backing companies now. And when they're mature, they really need someone to support them on the ground in China. So we've spent effort of setting up our own uh, branch offices and hire a staff of 20 in China to help companies to grow there. Um, this is our invested portfolios. So we've done 19 deals so far, and we had two successful exits. Uh, one of them is a mobile security company, Do Mobile. Uh, it's, it's one with the exit mark on it. Um, that's the, the one that we kind of we invested at their, the, the seed round. And after eight months, um, they were sold to Baidu for $36 million. And it's a local team, and they had a bit of global story that we could talk about later. Another one is Do Mobile. So this is that one. Um, Do Mobile uh, has a different name. It's, it's one of the two companies we have in China. We mostly invest in local companies, but we do have two companies that are currently located in China. Um, Do Mobile developed an app. In Chinese, their, their name is Kuaiya. I don't know if any of you guys heard of them. But it is the second fast-growing app in China market, period. And then and the, just a little bit shy of the first uh, fast-growing one, which is WeChat. So um, out of, we, we have two exits, and the other uh, 17 portfolio companies are doing really reasonably well. We don't have anybody uh, die yet, but um, things are going well, and half of them raised significant A round or B rounds uh, funding after we funded them. Um, and this is just a metric to, to analyze the aggregate uh, status of our portfolio companies. So um, they, they total currently are worth about $180 million. And all of them have raised right about $67 million after we funded them for their first round. So, um, so we continue to actively invest. We do two deals a month. Um, we prefer early stage deals where you know, technology founders have more of founder market fit. Um, and we look at both um, consumer and enterprise space. And um, as I mentioned, we do have um, 80 mentors who help us with mentoring um, founders and help up with uh, building up the support system and of course deal flow and referrals. Um, here is just a snapshot of um, our, our deal flows and the, the, the kind of and a distribution of sector, um, uh, different sectors of uh, deals. Um, all right, so um, another uh, effort that we do is really strategically set up uh, our platform to really help our companies to build meaningful relationships. So um, as you might already know, a lot of Chinese companies really are going out of China now, and they're really, really active in acquiring and investing in technology companies. Last year, the dollar amount uh, invested directly from Chinese technology companies in Silicon Valley alone already exceeded $1.3 billion. And uh, most people already know that the Chinese merchant acquisition market was really, really weak until about three years ago. It's getting really, really strong. So the market gets consolidated, and then the Chinese market is so competitive, the technology companies, the giants, are really hungry to acquire acquire talents, acquire technology, and they're really active, and they're really coming out to the valley. So building relationship with them early on also works, and it's one of the things that attracts a lot of entrepreneurs when we go out, build relationship with them, uh, because through us, they get to connect with a lot of companies. They're all big companies. Most of them are public, and because of their own um, line of business they have deep expertise on, it's quite competitive. They always think of other ways to branch out to increase their competitive and, and of course, bringing in the right talent, the right technology to help grow together. Um, so it's just we were voted uh, by one of the independent media last year uh, to be one of the 24 best local startup incubator in the Valley. And uh, yep, that's 
basically it's a basic intro of us. So I want to move on to um, some China related knowledge in the discussion. So before I go there, is there any questions about Inno Spring that any burning question you want to ask me? How do you deal with intellectual property issues across the continent and who retains ownership? Um, we we don't emphasize intellectual property ourselves. Um, companies that are smart knows to hire a good patent lawyers. Companies are really smart and smarter knows that intellectual property only works when they actually have users. It's, mo most, it's more important to get users, to get stickiness, to, to enter the market than so trying all the ways to protect the technology that they have. Competition is the, the reality in China. So I would say um, have all the protections working with all the law firms possible. But the market itself just is so potential, it's so big. For that reason alone, companies should consider going in there. They shouldn't stop because intellectual property protection is hard. How do you pick the stocks? In terms of what are your investment criteria going forward in terms of <coughs> Risk return and social responsibility. Uh, can you repeat? Sorry, I'm not hearing you very well. How do you pick the stocks? What are your investment criteria? Oh, our investment criteria. Um, we prefer to work with really smart founders who is in expanding market where they have prior expertise and where they have ambition to really grow it really, really big. In the early stage, we really emphasize on people, not so much on what they're doing. Even though we like to seek technologies, but we also need to see that their technology is in a space of solving a real problem. I guess we're kind of, we're, we're, we're sector agnostic. We're just finding entrepreneurs that are really, really good and eventually can build a successful business. A uh, real problem would be a problem and that existed for a while where for, for reasons that are probably technology related or not, it hasn't been fully re resolved yet and there will be a big um, a potential by solving that problem can improve users' lives, um, their lives, their um, experience or whatever. What is the size of your fund one and fund two? Uh, fund one was small. It was two million dollars, U.S. dollars. Fund two is five million dollars. Our fund circle, uh, fund cycle is really small because we're backed by VCs. We are much shorter than their cycle. Their cycle is generally ten years. Our cycle is six. So we go out, we raise a new fund every two years, and we spend all that money within two years. Uh, do you have competitors in the Chinese market? Um. Competitive, there are a lot, there are gazillions of incubators and perhaps some accelerators in China. We don't see ourselves competing with them because we're really focusing on the cross-border space. We are somewhat, we are competing with what 500 startups perhaps is trying to do, um, but most of our competitors are here, not so much we're competing with um, incubators in China. Good. Why don't we go on to uh, talk about China? We'll have more uh, general Q&A at the end. I just see a good friend. He probably can answer that question really, really well. <laughs> All okay. right. Um, okay. Okay. So, so when I was thinking about this, because what I always say is. Everybody is really talking about China. China market is just so big where it is probably the most important global story really in, in terms of business. I, yesterday I went out, I, I was doing a search about China in major business journals and I come up so many covers I, I just I just cannot say um, the, the how important China market really is to consider. Um, this is, if you look at really the statistic, I apologize, some of them are in Chinese because those are the statistics about the China mobile market. The China mobile market right now is 600 million. Really, there's 600 million of internet users in China right now at the moment. And um, we know that China has 1.3 billion population and there's a still huge potential for this number to go up. And it's really interesting that 80% of internet users in China are on mobile, on mobile users. It's, it's enormous. And if you compare the mobile users about um, 
uh, users in Android and iOS um, devices combined, it's already surpassed US. And um, the potential of growth is just really, really big. And it's really also interesting, I will talk about that, is one quarter of the mobile users are, are really grassroots. Um, those grassroots people never really have access to internet. I think the, the only access to internet for them is through their mobile phone, through their smartphone. It's very different from the consumers here. Um, after that Alibaba IPO, I think a lot of people really pay attention to technology companies in China. But if you look at the top 10 internet giants in terms of their market cap, um, you know, four of them are Chinese companies. Um, these are not companies that grow out of Silicon Valley. I think a lot of my friends who are really mainstream, they're American, they still think that no big internet uh, consumer business can grow outside of Silicon Valley. But that's not true. That's absolutely not true. Um, a lot of successful U.S. companies try to go to China for decades. I mean, most of them failed. Um, those are just a few of them. Um, I was thinking about talking about the reason. I guess it's probably going to be such a long discussion. Um, but it's very interesting. I want to tell a story where I met WhatsApp founder once, and he was giving a, a talk at Stanford, actually. And um, it was interesting because one of um, someone from the audience asked him a question of why he doesn't build stickers. I mean, stickers is a function that I think WeChat is really big about. Um, and so Facebook recently launched a lot of stickers on there. Um, and WhatsApp founders goes, um, I think it's too Asian. Um, we never think about that. We want to keep the product simple. It's too Asian. We don't. We never considered it. And then after probably another half an hour of his speech, and there's somebody else asked him about his global strategy. So he was talking about his effort of going to Asia market and and you know East Asia, of course, um, and India. He said um, we're we're not successful in China. He was really honest about it. And someone asked why, and then he mumbled, mumbled about another uh, ten minutes about it. <laughs> but what I see it is. It's 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 really it's it's actually quite common when I talk to people here where, when they think about China, they don't understand it and they don't want to go there and they don't want to spend an effort to understand it and they wonder why they're not successful, and then it, it, with some people might become cynical after that. So it's <laughs> it's 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 something. It's kind of you just need to have the mindset right. So those are just companies that fail. But recently, there are a few that are doing quite well. Um, I think Evernote is one of the companies that did really, really well in terms of localizing their business in China. Um, I mean, LinkedIn is trying now, Amazon is trying now, and uh, Uber is trying now. But we'll see what happens with them. Right. So um, if you talk about why, I borrowed this slide from my good friend from Innovation Works. I just want to start to talk about China, where it's really, really big, big market. It's really about the mass it is. Um, I don't know if any of you guys, how many of you guys have been to China before? Oh, OK, a lot of them. How many of you have seen tourists with that mass anywhere in China? Anyone? OK, some of you did. Um, you know, yeah, last night I was having a drink. I was catching up with one of my friends who just spent three weeks in China. He's Chinese, so we're good friends. Um, and he tells me, oh, you know what? I found out this really good hot pot place in, in Xi'an. Xi'an is where I'm from. It's a second tier city in China. It's nowhere compared to you know, the population of Beijing, Shanghai, the big cities. So he goes, oh, you know what? Um, I went to this place at 4 AM at night. And there's a long line. I waited for an hour to get in. So he told me that's, that's how crazy it is, how many people are going out. Most business, most, uh, most of the restaurants are open till what, 5 o'clock in, in the morning. And he goes, if you go to this restaurant, first of all, you need to get there early because at 3 AM, you cannot find parking. Second, there will be a long line outside of Hop Hop Place. But there are also small businesses trying to do your manicure when you're waiting in line. <laughs> Anyone have seen that? 
that's that's how big China is. It's crazy. So it's really massive market. So a lot of people, a lot of people in Silicon Valley, they don't realize that you really need a lot of operation experience to succeed in China. And a lot of local Chinese businessmen, even though they don't speak English, even though they don't know a word about technology, they have accumulated so such great operation experience that they themselves do not really realize that it's going to allow them to take over the world because nowhere is like the China market with the massive user out there. You really have to deal with this with every business. That's, this, is, this is the customer service experience that Alibaba has gone through for a decade. And the reason why they're successful is because they have armies of customer support folks to go on and talk to every one of them as small retailers, understand what they need, tailor their product to their need, build their product up, and eventually they can beat eBay. It's, it's really building out from small. And you really just need to go and understand how China works and how they think. Um, so, China, China, in terms of demographic, Chinese internet users are much, much younger. Um, the average age of Chinese internet users are, is 25. I mean, it's, it's much younger than the US internet users. And, um, and even though they're younger, and they're mostly grassroots, they're mostly lower um, blue color, but they're the, those are the ones that support the giant business, the ones like Tencent, the ones like Baidu. Um, Baidu last year made $10 billion in revenue. And it's made primarily through microtransactions and their QQ games. Um, but the average spending of a of user, average transaction is one RMB. It's really, really low, and they made a ten billion dollar business out of it. And and you, you you know that all of their software products are free. Um, it's it, you have to sell a free product, so they're really, really good at making money from a free product. So I heard think that from that point of view, monetization. I'm sorry, question. Sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna. I was wondering what the profitability on the ten billion in revenue is. I think it's two billion in profits last year. Don't know about any numbers this year. They're they're doing really well, and I think it's they grew about or about thirty percent from the year before. Okay, so the users in China they're very young. They're actually very demanding. They expect everything is free. They jump around products and. If, you know, if you decide to charge them, they will leave because there's no customer loyalty, none. They're really good at it. Even the clumsy products that probably is is worse alternative, but it's free, they'll jump on it because the, the internet is the only affordable channel where they get entertainment, information, and they spend most of their time on it. So they have all the time available. They want all the product free. And um, if you decide to do a company, there's not much of employee uh, loyalty either. I mean, I have so many friends running companies in China tell me that the biggest thing as a founder, the biggest challenge that they have to deal with is to lose, uh, is to, to deal with losing employees to competitors across the street. So they would hire a staffing agency. They would try to pay them just a little bit more of their current salary and just get them to leave. Uh, the competition is, is fierce. And then the copycat culture, not just from people trying to do the same thing, it's, it's from the giant companies. Um, instead of trying to go out and acquire new technologies, new product, they'll just staff an army of engineers and build it in three months and try to compete with you. So as a startup, it's really, really hard to survive there. Um, so we, ha we have invested the company, the company that became the second fast growing apps in China. Their strategy was um, to try their best to avoid attention, to avoid anyone knowing what they're doing from Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba. And what they did is to have a company um, policy where no one in the company is allowed to talk to anyone outside of a company about what they're doing. What's their product, what they're going after it, how they build it, where the company is going. 
the founder and the entire team was hiding in Beijing for a year and a half. They reject every media, they reject every friend trying to figure out what they're doing, and they reject everything. They, they refuse, they tell us really early on, if we were to tell people what they are doing about their business model, they're gonna have to go after it. They wouldn't be happy about it. So they, that's how really they avoid competition from big companies before they figure out their own product market fit. So it's really, it's really competitive out there. So yesterday, I, oh, not yesterday, last week uh, at lunch, I was talking about Groupon. Uh, someone was talking about uh, Living Social and Groupon. So I went out and I just searched how many companies that existed that are kind of in a Groupon group by business. And I came up about roughly 10 to 15 in US. Can anyone guess when Groupon like group buying business is hot in China, how many companies are doing similar things? Thirteen hundred. <laughs> doing the same thing. And 99% of them died. Probably not 99, 95 I would say. There are a few that survived after years of competing, years and years of iteration. A lot of big companies that was hot a year ago got cold this year. Um, unfortunately, one of them was a portfolio of one of our OPs, so I know that. But a couple of them survived, and they can still have a really lucrative business. But it's, it's competition is beyond scale. Our, the company that we invested in got 100 million users in China within a year and a half. And you know, when they go out and try to raise B round, VCs are just all over them. They, they're competing with their term sheet. They're competing with their evaluation. I got calls every day from VCs asking me about, oh, what's your company's doing? Can you get me in the deal? Um, but when you ask them, why are you so, you know, why are you so interested in this? People calling me and giving term sheet without even knowing the founders. But these guys just saying, we cannot jeopardize losing a deal with 100 million users. We go after deals when any company hit beyond 10 million, 10 million users. But if you ask the investors in the US, they will tell you any deals that has users more than a million, they would, they would probably go after it. It's scales different. It's very, very different. Um, so a lot of people ask me when I go out and give talks, people would ask me, um, you know, China is, is all about copycat. What do you want to do with that? It's probably the problem that spot, stopped me from going there or even considering going to China. Um, but over the past two years, I've been in this space. I really think that China is different now. People in China are getting more smarter and they're actually very, very innovative. I don't know how many, how many of you guys use WeChat? Okay, some of them, some of them, I, okay. If you use WeChat, if you have any Chinese friend who use WeChat, I would suggest you to go out and really try it and compare with WhatsApp, compare with Facebook, compare with other chatting apps. It's very different. It's not at all similar, it's very different. And it is it is better. It's been better a year and two years ago. It's really sticky. I have a friend who is American. His favorite app is WeChat and he's on there more active than I do. And he had like two contacts, me and someone else. He's really active, he's sending stuff all around one. He's just love it. It's really, really different. Um, and WeChat is free, complete free. You don't need to pay $1 a year to get it. You can have a lot of friends. I, I have 2,000 friends on there. I cannot live off WeChat right now at the moment. It's really, really good. Um, another company I really want to, I think it's really innovative I want to talk about is YY.com. Um, this is an example of another smart business that when you talk to US friends, they wouldn't understand. Anybody heard of YY.com? Can anyone explain what it does, what it is? <coughs> it is, no. I, I knew, you know YY, right? Yeah, of Andrew is a VC, um, he's from, um, um, oh, what, can, do you wanna talk about it? Sorry, I put you on the spot. I don't mean to, but what YY does? Well, YY is actually uh, 
it's a very special uh, tools that communicate. Um, I mean, this uh, U.S. doesn't have this culture, but in, in China, a lot of people, their only entertainment is uh, online and uh, you know, lo looking for some uh, like uh, broadcasting with uh, little girls that uh, they actually can talk, uh, have their small stations to broadcasting their uh, singing or dancing or those kind of thing. But uh, a lot of happy users just by spending a lot of uh, virtual gifts in order to ask. Uh, you know, little girls dancing or <laughs> singing. That. But I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, it's, it's just some, um, uh, 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 how to say that? It's a, uh, well, just as the name, right? It's a YY, mm -hmm. it means something that you can um, use yeah. your imagination. But yeah. it's, not a, it's not a porn or anything, <coughs> but just uh, <laughs> have people that uh, have you know, some more entertainment before their, uh, you know, their, their busy life uh, in the city or the. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some other factory. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a pretty good explanation. So YY is really is just a live video streaming platform out to a, more, a lot more users, a lot of users. It's kind of like just what Justin TV used to do, but as Justin TV struggled, YY thrived and they went IPO and when they go out to Wall Street and no one understand what they do because there's no equivalent in the US. What they really do is they enable people to broadcast whatever they do, performance, singing, anything they do to millions of people in China. And they, it's completely free. You can set up and you can do whatever you want. You can have your fan base. You can chat with them, interact with them. It is a technology company because the streaming was really, really seamless because we feel the CTO, he's a, he's a communication guy. But what's really, really innovative about it is they have figured out why some of the users really like to get on there. And they have figured out that these people, given they, that they don't have a lot of friends, they cannot afford uh, other expensive entertainment, they like to go online, find friends, they like to brag about them being uh, somewhat you know, economically uh, well uh, positioned. So they would go out and find a pretty girl on their singing. By the way, their singing mostly is horrible. I've been there, I try to, I cannot <laughs> sit even three minutes in. They're a horrible thing. They're not even dancers who are really, really good. They're really awful ones. But these are pretty girls. They're young. They're dressed nicely. They have well makeup, good makeup. They go there and um, they sing and they, they chat with people. And um, you know, people are willing to buy them virtual gifts. That's why. That's how I make money. And they're willing to spend tens of thousands of RMB just for one gift, virtual gift on the platform. And not just one. They have. Millions of people willing to spend thousands, tens of thousands of RMB just as virtual gift because it's more of a pride thing. If you have a hundred people in the chat room, and if the girl is doing something funny, for example, you want to be bidding on giving the gift. So the girl is getting a lot of gift, and then the people rise to top. She might just wave and kiss. That's it. Quite simple. Um, the company makes so much money. They're making a lot of money. So, in fact, I think Chinese people are so good at selling product to uh, grassroots. Uh, by the way, if internet is a big business, but you should know people who are actually upper class, they're never the one that actually pays. Uh, the one that pay money are really the grassroots people. They really are, they're not rich people at all. So they really supported the Chinese internet industry uh, economy. And, and I actually think that people um, that really understand that demographic also has a chance in the US, right? Recently, there's a deal wish.com where all it does is to move Taobao online commerce uh, to US, selling to a lower uh, middle class clients, it's like a Walmart's client. People who don't live in Silicon Valley, they can't afford to. They live in the Midwest or whoever, but those guys don't really have a lot of options of shopping online because they can only afford Walmart quality uh, clothing and fashion. So it's a web dedicated to sell Taobao goods to them because I can't buy the quality of the stuff on there. It's just horrible but it's a different demographic. It's Chinese founders and entrepreneurs really knows how to monetize from poor people. So I actually think that there's a lot of innovation happening. And um, if you look into it, I think China has definitely gone past the copy past, uh, copycat stage and culture and has gone out and really have something original and innovation coming out. 
Um, oh, so I talk about this. I really think that um, if Chinese founders are the ones that really knows the true meaning of um, freemium, because everything is free. Nobody expect to pay for software. Nobody expect to, to pay content. Nobody expect to pay anything online. But they can still make four of the 10 most lucrative internet business in the world. So um, that's, that's how China is. Um, any questions so, at this point? Time check? So I got it. Yeah, time check. We're doing fine. But I oh, got to okay. ask, if so much is free, how are these companies making money? Is it advertising or is it, I mean, the virtual gifts is one thing, but is it mostly advertising that these internet companies are doing or what? Different companies have spent uh -huh. years and figured out different ways. Yeah. So Tencent, what they do is basically um, microtransactions mm -hmm. of, about dressing up their persona differently in the virtual world. That's primarily where they make money from. Um, there are, they develop games, so transactions within games, purchases, those are also contributing to their revenue. Baidu does it differently, where instead of, they, they figured out this business is, is willing to pay for a lot and bid a lot for a placement of their ad. It's kind of like what Google does. But they also change the rankings. It wouldn't be a complete organic search ranking, but they change the ranking secretly. So they actually opened up a lot of business. That's how they make a bulk of their money from. Taobao has been free, and they announced it free forever, long, long time ago in terms of listing. But they also figure out ways. Uh, one of the ways they do is promoted links on the sidebar. But I think the biggest money that they make, right, I think right now, is through financial services, mm -hmm. right? They, um, they can also open up a Tianmao type of brand uh, boutique stores, where um, brand owners is willing to brand themselves within the Tianmao, because it's kind of like a, a, a brand that recognize um, a kind of a clean cut product where there, there wouldn't be any counterfeit into it. It's kind of a special store online storefront, it's kind of like what Shopify does, okay. but they do it for small businesses. But you have to pay a lot of money to get in. Okay. So I think different companies really figure different out a different thing. way. Yeah. Okay. One, go ahead. How is WeChat making money? They're not making money now. <laughs> I think because WeChat is within the umbrella of Tencent, Tencent is already making billions of dollars. The fact that they are able to grab, oh, I don't know how many users they have, but definitely more than Huge. Two, two, 500 million. They have so many users, they're gonna figure out a way to make a tiny amount of people pay for something. I think recently, have you, has anyone tried Hongbao on WeChat yet? Okay. Some, okay. We have tried a, a different, a little, a different type of things, little things. So around the new holidays, WeChat has launched a homebow where you you can send you can send a gift. It's kind of a cash gift to your friends. But they gamify it where if I were to send twenty dollars, for example, to a hundred of my friends, they need to click a button and do a lottery, and the lottery come up different results, right? I have, uh, oh, by the way, I have made 2,000 RMBs just to get home bows around the New Year's myself. And I was so addicted because you have, you see someone sending out a home bow to a group. You want to click on it and you want to click it. So, so if you get lucky, you get the biggest lottery and then you brag about it. That's all it is. It's not a lot of money. Um, but they take a little bit of transaction fee to get money in and out because they're trying to do financial services now. But it's a really fun game, um, really addictive. There are some other things. Well, they channel a lot of shopping now into WeChat, almost like a mobile portal of a customer service or even mobile stores. So you can, I have no one of my friend, he, he doesn't have an online store. His online store is completely 100% within WeChat. So you could buy stuff in WeChat, you use WeChat Pay, that's the payment thing that they recently announced. And of course, there's a service fee. So there's the different ways they could do it. I'm very interested in the difference between US and China in customers. And so uh, I think, I, and you say that um, um, China is in a more in a mobile central, central and, and 
and you uh, show you know, uh, more customers and using uh, social networking service. So I think you know, those you know, may, might make the landscape of markets <coughs> different. You know. So uh, 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 customers may you know, different, uh, behave differently from the, the USA. So uh, does it make sense? Sorry. Uh, no, I, th I think the, the, the amount of social interaction, social network interaction is high. And especially what you're talking about, the grassroots users, that that is their entertainment. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a real revelation. Yeah. That it's not the people that you think of as having a lot of money. It's really the people who just have a little bit and a cell phone. Yeah. And this is, you know, what they're doing to enjoy themselves. Yeah. Micro payments, but huge mass, and you know, basic service expectation is free, but people will pay for something if they see value in it. Yeah. Even if it's something like a virtual gift or uh, you know, a uh, home bow that is an, basically a, a limited lottery. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is great. Let me suggest that you finish up your prepared remarks first, and then we'll do general Q and A. Okay. okay. So, all right, um, I just want to land on some discussion about going global because I've got a lot of people ask me, um, should I, when should I consider going global? Should I even think about it? Um, and what are the criteria? So i uh, try to set up some something together. So in general, if we go out and talk to entrepreneurs, um, we think that they they need to think about go, going global if they fit into these three things. I'm not saying this is complete, but these are three things I could come up with. Um, for some businesses where you have a bulk of your customers really existed outside of your um, your hometown or your whatever location you are, so then you, it makes sense to think about global. But there's another way around where maybe there are already enough um, users in your home base, but based on your understanding of users in, in a different market, user adoption, the barrier to adoption could be way lower in a different market. So some things just gets penetrated a lot faster. Um, for example, things that are really appealing to local economy and culture, like on-demand drivers, because right now China bans driving with alcohol altogether. I mean, it's no, zero alcohol, right? So the on-demand driver business literally was, is booming in China because of that. Um, some things, uh, just like car sharing, I've seen people trying to do car sharing in the US, but the fact that everybody have a car, it's hard to take off because the, the alternative is not so bad. But in China, the truth is traffic is horrible. Most people just can't afford a car yet, car sharing makes more sense. So if there are equally use, equal user base between US and, and the different market, but if you think that for different reasons, the different market users in different market might actually adopt to your technology or pro product faster, you might think about a global strategy. And the third way, uh, what I observe is a lot of companies might not be founded in Silicon Valley. I've seen a lot of companies founded in the Midwest, a lot of companies founded in Europe, where they wander around in Europe, for example, um, they can't get funding because the local entrepreneurship ecosystem just isn't that strong. And then uh, the, the limited VCs that they can have access to generally price their product at a lower point, whereas Silicon Valley has so much hype. If they come here, their startup gets priced really high, and they have way more early adoption in the valley, so they decided to come to US. Well, that's also another reason why I start up actually branch out. But um, if you ask about the question one, because I have recently, um, one of our portfolio company asked me about this. Um, going global, it really needs to, to, the timing. The timing really needs to be right. So typically, unless uh, the product business really has a unique fit of a different market, then you actually want to go there and understand your user, understand the market before you start uh, building a really the right product. If you're just a generic entrepreneur, you have an idea, you don't have a product yet, you haven't figured out uh, what customers want, you don't have customers yet, uh, you better stay local, has that foundation, and then think about where it really is the best market to go into. Um, so another thing would be that um, 
understanding, I think, is really a big barrier, right? Because if founders don't understand a different market, going there really takes a lot of effort and money. So they might just stay in local market and see in the future if they have a, a, the right time and the right people, right resources to go there. Um, all right, I think I touched upon the last point. I right, just move on. Um, all right, so just to conclude, I have a checklist of things that you can consider if you think about going global. Um, and then um, this may not be exhaustive list, but it's just a list I can think of just to get you set up. Um, I should say that as I talk about um, countries are different, markets are different. I think businesses are there to work with people, to work with the ecosystem there instead of trying to change it. So really having the adaptive mindset to partner up with people, try to fit in instead of trying to change it, is a better way to think of it if you actually want to survive in a different market. Um, and then for me, my bias really is if you want to be successful, especially in a market like China, so it's so different, it's really hard for someone who has no knowledge to really pick up their understanding of the local market. So you really need a partner, um, preferably local. Uh, you need the right partner to help you with expanding to that market. Um, don't want to talk about government relationships. It would be a, another discussion, but it's something just to look out for. Um, usually, if you have a startup, if a product uh, in, within the internet industry, um, it's less of a problem compared with other type of entrepreneurship and projects. Um, I think that's what I. Uh, that's all I have. Um, thank you okay, very much. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I get to ask the first question. I think a lot of the interest in people to get into the Chinese market now is really people who came from China to here, <laughs> went to school here, worked for here for a few years. What are the dangers for somebody who's been here who is from China? Uh, do you find that they are generally successful or are there things that surprise them about China now? Um, they do now. Um, I think I would say five, ten, five years ago, sea turtle entrepreneurs are really, really popular. Every VC firm wants to work with the sea turtle entrepreneurs because these are guys that get to train to be professional managers. They get to train to how to build a product, to how to sell, to how to work with people, to how to manage a team. Um, that's really important. Um, it's the reason why they could actually succeed, for, for the record, Sea Turtle Entrepreneur has been really successful in China for a decade. Um, the reason, part of the reason is that there's not much foundation competition there, and the, the, the millennium hasn't really rise up yet. People that are there is probably of my age, mm -hmm. and the Sea Turtle Entrepreneurs can relate to people that are really, um, pretty much the same age bucket with them. So they understand who they are, what they do, because they grew up in China. Mm -hmm. So they can build, it's easy to build a product that appeals to them. But lately, in recent years, Chinese market has changed a lot. The next generation millennium uh, users started to come up. They're much, much younger. Um, they're in their early 20th. They're a decade apart from a lot of sea turtles who spend most of their year here. Um, they think very differently. And the next, that younger generation demographic, ha um, most of them um, have a very good economic basis because their parents are doing really well and they spoil them. And this generation thinks very different. And they're much different than um, the first generation or second generation of you know, immigrants who come to US and get educated. So from that point of view, um, a lot of sea turtles just have trouble adapt to yeah. that type of understanding. Um, to, to, to starting out a new business. Okay, great. Let's open the floor. There are people who are being very patient. Go ahead. I saw your hand earlier. Okay, so um, you spoke a little bit about um, understanding scale as a major dif differentiator between um, US, U.S. startups and Chinese startups, and you also spoke about um, how that Chinese sort of copycat culture is now um, starting to be less and less of an issue, which is um, really great to hear. Um, I was wondering whether you could speak a little bit about the role of, and I'm sorry to go here, but internet censorship. Um, and 
how that could impact um, startups from U.S. who would like to enter the Chinese market. Do you believe censorship in U.S.? Do I believe that there's censorship in the U.S.? Yes, but in less explicit and formal forms. I think you already have an answer. It's two different country. They um, they um, they handle it differently. And if you, it's 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 like if if I want to go out to a friend's home, I should be nice to the host because it's their home. If I were to sell in a different country, I should apply to a law and regulation over there. Whether or not I approve it, it's a different question. Sure. So, um, what are some challenges then for potential, you know, that startups should navigate around um, or understand a little bit in more in depthly in order to navigate this market? Um, I would say communication really is important. The government there is there really is to support businesses, and I truly believe that. A lot of startups choose to hire one person, and that person's entire job is to communicate and coordinate with the government. That's the last point I have on my previous slide. You really want to have the government relationship work for you. As long as you're in an open communication with the government, even if things go wrong, you could make it right. Um, try not to play in the danger zone. Just keep the communication and relationship working. And most time, you you be fine. Go ahead. That's all you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Because you're saying that they are literally like all the grassroots people. I'm wondering like if you can share some tips like how to communicate with them, how to make my product. You know, for example, is the WeChat uh, like <laughs> product. How to make those product go viral in those DLC group. Right. Um, I could use an example of how one of our company actually succeeded. Um, everyone knows that Apple is mostly manufactured by Foxconn type of factories in Shenzhen. Um, in fact, that the, one of the most prominent demographic of the users that use Kuaya, Du Mobile, our company, is Mingong. It's just worker, factory workers, and. The reason, it was really, it was a coincidence. They didn't know that um, those workers actually liked their product. But when they found out that there are a lot of local workers are signing up, they staff a team to sit outside of the factory gate and just sit there all day talking to them at lunch and dinner, asking if any of them want to sign up for their product. Once they did, they asked them if they like it, how they use it, in what context, and what their feedback about the product. That's how they realize why their users like to use it, and then they adapt and they change their product according to that. Um, so it's really all about getting closer to them. You just need to talk to them. It's very similar, doing interviews, understand what they want. Find out that stickiness, that pain point that your product hits, that really make them want to come back to your product. That's how you build a product that they it can grow. OK, let's go over here. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned just now that, that new young demo, uh, demographic are not loyal to any like products. Is there any strategy around it, like building a good brand? Or, or would you say that you just have to make the product really sticky or like what kind of what kinds of strategy can you overcome the kind of problem? Um, I'm not sure if I, I can answer a question in the best way, um, but I I believe in a product centric strategy. I think whatever you do, you need to sell, you need to get users, you need to make sure you solve something that the users want to come back to. Um, I personally st still think that product is is the, the most important thing in your company. Brand can really help, but as you hit the product market fit, you find out what users really, really want, you, you go on a projection of faster exponential growth, brand can help you differentiate your message and yourself, can help increase loyalty, even though you know loyalty is really hard, but it's, it can facilitate growth. But I personally still have the bias of believing in product itself. Over here. Uh, what in your opinion are the main reasons why uh, successful US companies fail in China, like Google? What, what lessons learned? 
Um, I think different pro companies sort of have a different problems. Um, Google, I, I'm not an ex expert about um, Google, how, how Kaifu actually run Google China would really come out. But my observation as a, you know, on the side was I think China is a different market. Google is smart enough to hire a group of really talented people who understand China to run the game. But the problem is, um, do you notice that um, same internet company that they may appear to be similar, make money differently. They all hit different pain points. So as a subsidiary in China, they really need a lot of freedom to run the business, the same business differently. I think that might create a lot of friction because the headquarters are getting nervous because their product is not sold the same way. The price is all over the whack. Um, they have to build functions that they never be able to use in the US, but only in China. That creates a lot of tension between the US and China team. Eventually, if the China team doesn't have freedom to do what they do, they're gonna fail. It's both the timing and the competition. There's millions of other people trying to do the same thing. Okay. Well, you're changing your, your slide. Just oh, went sorry. Off. Uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't while my we get schedule. Back to that, I think I <laughs> saw your hand next. Go ahead. Um, could you talk a bit more about enterprise software space in China? I think this is more catered to consumers. Obviously, you invest a lot in cloud and enterprise, too. How is it different in China? Um, it's really hard. <laughs> enterprise market has been hard for a long, long time. Just nobody really recognized the value of software. I would say um, in recent years that has started to change. Small businesses has realized that for them to really scale and compete, they really need professional internal management. I really need um, software to help cut down their cost because you know the cost of hiring uh, with with um, with talent and then um, and employees is also rising so they have more need to use software to do something um, that they would have done by hiring cheap labor in the past so I see enterprise picking up slowly but it's definitely still behind us us is still much a stronger uh, market actually the hand I saw was behind you you had a question. Okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, you know uh, we learned a lot about uh, doing the cross-border startups where the market is in China. Uh, the question I had was, uh, do you see any trend or any any opportunities for the other way around, where there's a lot of the stuff that's happening in China, but the market could be in the U.S. and uh, could there be some cross? Do you see any areas where uh, some of those could be applied for you know, for Chinese companies to be? To, uh, focusing on the U.S. market, right? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I, f f in in terms of volume, I actually see more Chinese companies trying to come out. It's probably because I'm talking to a lot of them in the first place. Um, another thing is um, a lot of them don't understand Silicon Valley. So they, they kind of like started this exploration type of um, scene. Um, a lot of products that don't do well in China for the same reason people try to come out and see if they can sell in here. But most of them also struggle um, for the same reason because it's a different market for them to, to get in and understand. Um, Chinese people are really good with technology. Um, I've seen the field that actually succeeded was more of technology heavy, less of the sales, less of a consumer type of um, startups. Um, over time, it, it could get better because I see a lot of second generation Asian American or even people who are um, educated here, but um, they've been to U.S. really long, long time ago. They've spent a decade more than that here. And those are the one more of um, um, have have gotten, gotten over the hurdle of understanding U.S., so they might actually be able to have a, a company that can thrive. But it's still in the early stage. Um, there are a lot more Asian, a lot more Chinese founders apply to YC, a lot of uh, students from Berkeley, from, um, from Stanford, coming out as Asian and instead of joining big companies, and they act actually choose to start a company. It's changing very rapidly because they, they're more favor of um, flexible, 
typical um, entrepreneurship environment instead of a big corporation. That has been changing. So I see that um, that trend is going. I would um, I would say there will be a lot more Chinese people trying to do business in Silicon Valley going forward. Okay, you've been very patient. Go ahead. Hey, um, I'm trying to ask you, like, you know, you mentioned about like, your car sharing service in China before. One of my friend actually, you know, started a company in Beijing like three or four years ago. At that time, because like most of the, you know, like a uh, Chinese Chinese families in big cities, they have like two or three like cars for for each family, so so they don't need like you know the, the extra like one or two cars so they can like share with each other. But the government has a regulation like two two years ago, right? Like you know, there's a restriction for people to buy cars in the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai. Yeah. So that's why you know they kind of like are struggling with their service right now. And also like build, Beijing and Shanghai, they're building like 14, 15 like lines, you know, of subways. Yeah. So a lot of people just go to the public service. Right. They're trying to come come to the states to look for some kind of opportunities because let's say you know most of the states, you know, a lot of people have cars. You know, they they, they go to work by cars. Uh, what's their process to come to you guys to help them out? And do you have any kind of uh, advice for them to come to the states? Um, are they? Um, this is company founded by Chinese founders. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, I think um, I would say if anything, uh, we are better at knowing the space before they did. I mean, we had two year history here. We can help them plug in with people that they need to talk to for them to get started. Um, for us, we are an investor. We're definitely actively in investing. Um, we're mostly interested in investing business that are here first. But we have seen a lot of reverse entrepreneurship happening. Um, we haven't done any deal at this point yet, but we'd be, you know, we're interested in looking at it. Why do you think Evernote's done so well in China? Because their local team is really, really strong. They're really okay. young, okay. and they understand that they have to start from the ground up. They understand the serve, the product has to be free. Yeah. Yeah. So they hit all the checkpoints, and um, and plus they have the right partner. That's really important. Yeah. Um, the lead investor that brought them to China is CBCVC. They're also one of our LPs. Mm -hmm. They partner up with Sequoia, and they have um, government relationship, and they have really decades of experience in telecommunication in China. They've set up a um, really good ground up partnership for them. So okay. that helped. Go ahead. Uh, so would Chinese investors be interested in funding American startups for an American market? Oh, absolutely. We've been doing that for two years. Okay. Yeah. Basically, about what I'm doing at the moment. OK, sure, definitely. Okay. There are a lot Offline. of other investors, too. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ed. Um, what foreigners have been most successful in business in China? And uh, the context I mean is, for instance, are Singaporeans better than Germans? Um, <laughs> oh God, I haven't seen a lot of German entrepreneurs in China, though. I was just. Well, Mercedes, BMW, I mean, you could say. Oh, I'm sorry, companies found it. Oh, okay, companies. Um, I don't think I have the right information to answer that. I, I, I'm a scientist by background. It's a, it's if I don't have the data, question. but we can I talk don't. talk about it at some point. Yeah. Let, let me suggest that I think to wrap this session up, I'm really, I want to get back to the role of the accelerator a little bit. Do you think that it's, how important is it for a company that's starting up here that's looking at China to go to an accelerator? Um, correction, we're actually an incubator. We don't run an accelerator You class. don't call yourself an accelerator, okay. No, because we don't believe that the going global or even entrepreneurship should be easily timed. So you're a combination incubator and seed fund. Yeah. Right, where yeah. you are providing the benefits of seed fund investors, the connections and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. With that and, you know, so how important is the co-working space? Co-working space, is helpful, um, but it provides a physical space for us to build the real face-to-face mm -hmm. -face relationship with entrepreneurs. The benefit of that is that we see people working in there day in and day out, because um, a lot of our company get funding from a lot of VCs uh, beyond us and our investors. We are the one that knows who's working really hard. We know some companies are doing well. We know com some companies just can't make it, but it was an obvious from an investor point of view. We know our companies. It's one way, the best way to understand startups and founders to see how they work. I think that's a great answer. And I tell you what, on that note, 
let's call an end to the formal part of the session today. We've got the refreshments outside, and I know there's a lot of people who want to talk to you about specific things as well as in general. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Shao, thanks again for a great presentation.